Welcome to everyone. A very special Sunday. For some of us, it's the first Sunday morning service in church for a long time. Uh, I think it's the first time we've had a real congregation and perhaps some people watching um, at home. So a great welcome to them too. Uh, and thank you for all those who've been involved with the technical side of this. Um, we are a limited number. I was going to say you would then have to sing up more loudly but please don't, because we're not allowed to sing. Um, I think we are allowed to breathe, so we should be okay. We're again, um, I'm leading Michael. I've done some of these services before. Jill is helping me, and Shalia, and others too. But before we start, we have some bands. I shall move out of the way. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very happy to do this. It's, I'm publishing the Bands of Marriage for a couple that have been blessed through this year. <laughs> you know, will we, will we get to the church to get married? And they've still got some difficulties, but we're going ahead anyway and ironing things out as we go. I'm sad they're not here at the moment, but they've got a long, they'd have a long journey today. Anyway. I'm publishing the Bands of Marriage between James Andrew Lee, who is single, of Ashton in Northampton, and Bryony Gabrielle Marshall, also single, of Ashton in Northamptonshire. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. We pray for these couples as they prepare for their weddings. Lord, the Lord of all true love, we pray for this couple. Grant to them joy of heart, seriousness of mind, and reverence of spirit, that as they enter into the oneness of marriage, they may be strengthened and guided by you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. We will now have the first song. There's no need, I think, to stand. It will appear on the screen. 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's a new day. Um, we're going to sing your song again, whatever lies before us. Yeah. 
Well, this is a family service, but we have a slightly restricted number. But I thought, um, well, we'd better start with a theme. This is something we all are, or at least we were. Something we cannot escape, whether we're young or old. Something we probably don't think about once we've left our parents' home and started an independent life as being. So I suppose you've all got it by now. Yes, we're talking about children. We're all children, and yet we tend to think of children in a particular way, perhaps. So we're going to start by a quiz, it's family service, on children. It's not just for children, but it involves about children. Um, under the current restrictions, no calling out, please, uh, or speaking answers, but you can keep your own score. There's two sets of five questions, so at all what you scored. So modern English, number one. The word children is one of only three words where the plural is formed by adding the suffix n. Think of one of the other two. So children, something else like something n. Some of you got it, I think. You can have brethren and oxen. I haven't checked all the others. So that gives you one mark if you've got one of those. Number two, we're into the average fertility rate worldwide. The number of children a woman gives birth to for all countries right across the world. I choose at least one correct answer from the following three choices. For the two years in which the number of children born to each mother was A, five, and B, 
just under half that, 2.4 children. Difficult to think of that exactly. So you can choose either the 1960s, the 1990s, or 2019, and then link it with the number five or the number 2.4. You've got quite a high likelihood of getting it right, I think. So the correct answer for A, five, is the 1960s. That was the average fertility rate around the world. And the correct answer for B, just under 2.4, is 2019. So you can see it's just over halved. Right, now you have to choose at least one of two countries, A, the one with the highest fertility rate today at 6.9 children per mother, and B, the one with the lowest at just under one per mother. And you can choose between Italy, Japan, Niger, and Singapore. So the correct answer is A, Niger, for the country with 6.9, and B, Singapore, the country with just under one. I'm sure there are others too. I can see in the back row someone's going quite well. Uh, number four, how long does it take for the average child to quadruple the birth rate, or increase it, that is, by four times? Is it going to be one year, two year, or two years, or three years? One year, two year, three years for quadrupling the birth weight. And the answer is two years, apparently, according to my sources. And the last one on these details, uh, number five, between four and six months, what is the typical growth rate for a child's head circumference? Is it going to be a quarter of a centimeter per month, half a centimeter per month, or one centimeter per month? Difficult one. Um, so the answer for that is one centimeter per month. You don't have to do a thing. Don't call out, please. But if you wish, you may raise a hand uh, very gently to indicate you've scored what well, you won't want to, I guess, zero or one or two or three or four or five. Oh, brilliant. Well done. We've had a, someone admitting to four near the front. That's really good. Thank you. I don't think I would have known that. Right, now we go on to facts or fake news. Number one, just after birth, a baby sees only in black and white with shades of gray. Is that a fact or fake news? Answer, a fact. Number two, babies and children can laugh up to 300 times a day. Adults typically laugh up to 2,000 times a day. Is that a fact or fake news? That is fake news because adults supposedly laugh up to 20 times a day. <laughs> it's difficult being an adult. Uh, number three, quite a complex one. Between the ages of one and two years, we'll gain two million new brain connections every second. At two years of age, a child has more than 100 trillion new brain connections or synapses, synapses if you're American. However, when a child finally becomes an adult, more than 50% of these acquired synapses disappear. Is that fact or fiction? That is fact. Number four, but by the age of six, it is said that the average child can understand about 1,300 words. An average adult has a vocabulary of about 60,000 words. Is that fact or fiction? Fake news. <clears throat> that is fake to this because it says that a child at six can understand some 13,000 words. More than I thought, but that's what it said. And the final one comes from the National Teething Week Association, which reported that 68% of parents have left a public place because of a crying child. Is that a fact or fiction? A few parents seem to show in one version. So a fact, that's what they said. So anyone who admit that they scored, what should we say, four, five, that sort of level? Oh, lovely lot. Good, well done at the back. So thank you for that. And so that's going to be our theme and it's going to come up in the Bible readings and we're going to talk about that 
as the service goes on. But first, we have another song, Blessed Be Your Name, by Matt Redman. The land that is plentiful, uh, in the land that is plentiful, and on the road marked with suffering. And I think we're very aware of the contrast at the moment between the land that's plentiful and suffering. today and I've divided them up into three and then I'm going to give short comments on after each one. So we'll start with the one from Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans 8 verses 14 to 17. The children of God For those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ's sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Thank you. In verse 15, we were told, we are children of God if led, led by the Spirit of God. So how are we God's children? 
two aspects. We can be God's children in our attitude and accepting. What's a characteristic difference between children and adults? It's not just growth and laughter or having to attend school, if it's on. Children love to ask why, but they need simple answers. Is a simple answer right? Yes, it can be. Suppose I want to measure one meter. I could get out a bit of string like this, and that, oh dear, a knot has appeared. Uh, this is exactly one meter. I measured it beforehand, up to the beginning of the knot. So that's one end there, and that's where my fingers are, the other end, exactly one meter. Okay, but you might say, well, that's not really the way you should measure. You should have a decent tape measure with all the bits and pieces on it, feet and inches as well as meters. Which is more accurate? I, don't, I think they're the same for the meter. So, I think sometimes we make things quite complicated as Christians. Actually, it can be quite simple, childlike. And that's, I think, something Paul is telling us. And then in verse 17, we're told, if we are children, then we are heirs of God. Children like to know where they are, how they relate to others, especially adults in their lives. As they grow older, they realize that they, in a sense, too, are heirs. I doubt whether Prince Louis, age two, realizes that he is an heir to the monarch and fifth in line to the throne at the moment. I saw this week that according to his mother, the Duchess of Cambridge, Prince Louis wants to give everyone a big hug these days. Although I suspect that he, when he's older, he, like his grandmother the Queen, may not want to hug everyone he has to meet. In verse 17, Paul told the Romans and us that if we are God's children, then we are his heirs and co-heirs with Christ. And so we share, and we come back to this, his sufferings in also, in also to share in his glory. So we need know these two things. If we're led by God's spirit, we're God's children, doubtless in our attitude of asking and accepting, and as God's children, we are legally God's heirs if we share in his suffering to also share in his glory. Now we're going to go on to the second part of that reading. Romans 8, verses 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will re be revealed in us. For the creation waits eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Thank you. This is an amazing message, isn't it? The whole creation has been grown 
up to the present time, the time when creation has waited eagerly for God's children to be revealed. I think we are very aware that creation is still groaning as we see global warming, air particulate pollution, none of which we can see directly, but we can see their effects. And often we're aware of the role humans play in bringing about these problems. Sometimes we don't see or realize even what we lack physically. This is, was true in the following story I'll read, where Tony Beltram, now the National Compassion Director in Dominican Republic, didn't realize his state of poverty as a child until this incident. And it was only through God's children reaching out through compassion that his life was changed. So this is what he wrote. The first time I realized I was living in poverty was when I walked into my house and my mother was praying. She was, Lord, we have nothing to eat. We have nothing but you. That was the day I realized that I was poor. It suddenly made sense why we didn't have any running water, why there were days when we didn't have any food to eat. I blamed myself, thinking, maybe we are living in poverty because of me. Maybe eating too much. Maybe I'm asking too much of my parents. I felt hopeless. That day, I asked my dad if I could help, so we built a shoe shining box together. I used to go walking around the streets asking people if I could shine their shoes for money. I also started selling cornbread while all the kids were playing games at school. I did whatever I could to get some money and help my family. I didn't want to be a burden. But when God brought the Compassion Project into my family and I was found a sponsor, I began to see a change. At the project, things were different. We would play games and there would be time for curriculums. People cared about me and showed me God's love. So that's one example, I think, of the way in which we can see God's creation groaning and yet being changed. We, like creation, are also groaning as God's children, being brought into the true freedom and glory of God's children. Now we're going to switch to the New Testament passage, which is the parable of the weeds. And Shalia is kindly going to read that. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. The parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The, uh, the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seeds in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 43. The parable of the weeds explained. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. His field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Thank you very much. Long reading. 
So the parable of the weeds. One of the good experiences during lockdown was taking walks on local footpaths through the beautiful countryside of North Buckinghamshire. Back in March, many fields had just been planted and there were small seedlings their way up through the soil. By June, the crops were a foot or two high and we could try to identify them. Take this, these little seeds. They're nothing to do with wheat. They were growing beside a path. Uh, I think might be called a weed, so I hope that will reassure you. We can't see the future plants, but we wait in hope and expectation that God will ensure it grows. So much more with us as his children awaiting full adoption. In the parable, we are the good seeds, the people of the kingdom, the children of God. Like the seeds when planted, will doubtless grow into heirs of God, looking quite different from seeds and different weeds too. And like the children of God, we can look forward to the time when, as in verse 43, we are, we are as the righteous, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So I hope that's given us an overview from those two readings, from Paul and uh, Matthew, on our role as children, as part of God's family, God's kingdom here on earth. We're now going to have another song, and uh, this is the key, living in God's spirit, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, I'm a child of God. During Lent, I read um, a meditation which really spoke to me at the time. 
And it was just on this theme of being a child of God. And at the top of the page, um, there was a Bible reading, John 1, verse 12. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And this was Gideon Hughes' focus as he wrote this poem for the Tear Fund Lent devotional this year. <clears throat> I've adapted it just slightly, and here it is. Here I am, a child of God. I'm free from ambition, free from the desire to please, free from striving and straining and the need to succeed. I am free from the rat race, from the struggle to be first, free from the grasping and clutching and the ego's desperate thirst. I'm free from vanity, from wearing a false face, free from image and status and pride's fruitless chase. I'm free from possessions, from diluting life with stuff, free from others saying that I'm not enough, free from my past, free from any bruise or scar, free from guilt, free from shame. Here I am, I am a child of God. And now we're going to hear from um, the songwriter Chris Tomlin and hearing him sing the wonderful words, forever God is faithful, forever.
Those are great words of assurance, aren't they? Let's pray together. Gideon Hughes' poem speaks powerfully of the liberation which comes when through our faith in Jesus, we are accepted into God's family as his children. As God's son or daughter, we are given his Holy Spirit who continues to change us from the inside, filling us and topping us up with the qualities we need to live in this world. As the song says, now I am your child, I am adopted in your family, and I can never be alone, because Father God, you're there beside me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit to be the fire in my heart, the wind in my sails, my hope, my song, my guide, my strength. We pray for those children of God who face great hardship, violence and war, hunger, homelessness, illness and injustice. Father God, fill with hope through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray for those children of God who are closely involved with the current pandemic. Heavenly Father, and those who are weary with giving advice or searching for treatments and a vaccine. Father God, fill them anew with hope through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray for those in our families, among our friends, our community, our country, and our world, who have not heard or think they do not need to know the saving power of faith in Jesus Christ. Father God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to bring the good news of our Christian hope to everyone we can reach. Heavenly Father, we ask these prayers 